You're listening to the All-Star Charts Podcast with J.C. Perez on technicalanalysisradio.com. All right, everybody. We are back with my friend Paul Siena. Paul joins us here from Bank of America. Paulie, thank you for being here on the show. My pleasure, J.C. Good to be here. Good to hear from you, too. I've been trying to get you on for a while. Um, you know, Paul, Paul's a big deal, ladies and gentlemen, right? FICC, technical strategist at Bank of America, Merrill Lynch Global Research, which I think is the longest title I've ever heard. So congratulations on that. Thank you. What, is, what does that mean? What's FICC stand for? Look, outside of the equity markets, FICC is essentially everything else, right? It's a big world out there. FICC, fixed income, currencies, and commodities. We can even add a third C if we wanted to and say credit markets, okay? So, you know, what's happening to the dollar? What's happening to interest rates? What's happening to oil, copper, gold? And what's happening to, you know, the, the, the leveraged markets and, and credit and loans and things like that? And what's the difference between fixed income and credit? Is it is, is like credit other things and then fixed income is just kind of like the bond market? What's the difference? Yeah, so, you know, I think, Fixed income is a very broad, big, general term uh, on my side. Uh, frankly, you know, there's there's a head of thick markets uh, in, in in the global side of our business that essentially covers everything, and we all fall under that umbrella. So, uh, when you think about you know general fixed income, yeah, you can think about where's U.S. ten-year Treasury yield, you know, where's the two-year yield, right? Where's the two-ten spread going, right? But when you move over into the credit side, is you know, what are the big corporations doing? You know, are they borrowing? Are they lending? You know, what's the sovereign outlook for certain countries and what's their credit rating and ranking at? And should we be buying or selling that credit, you know, paying or receiving or, or really the right terms, right? Um, so it's it's big, it's global, right? Uh, it's not just US tenure, but it's frankly global tenures, right? You have bone yields, you have JGB yields, you have, you know, frankly Australian yields. You know, we had a, a big rally in VTPs and then another sell-off. So, uh, you know, interest rates are, are everywhere and, and figuring out where they're going is a big part of the market. Paul, one of the best things that you told me recently was that, I mean, you're, you're fortunate you get to speak with the biggest PMs in the world, right, on a daily basis. I mean, that's literally your job. And what you told me is that all the big time PMs look at charts. They do. You know, the truth is out. You know, big time PMs who I hope and wish and try to talk to every day. <laughs> And I do get the opportunity to from time to time, which is, uh, you know, the most exciting part of this role, frankly. Um, you know, they look at charts. They do. The, the guys that have been doing this for a while, they know a good chart and they know a bad chart. And they appreciate, uh, I guess you could say, a seasoned technician's opinion on what that chart is saying. And then, you know, what's really important is really wrapping around the macro narrative and seeing uh, an issue at hand to try and say what the chart actually says the resolution to that issue may be, right? Uh, lately, a couple of examples of that could be Brexit, right? You know, is there going to be a peaceful resolution or is there going to be, you know, uh, not peaceful resolution, something terrible, right? And in our charts, you know, the weekly chart of, of cable, the sterling versus the U.S. dollar, you know, we've been seeing a, a head and shoulders base pattern there and it's been holding up fairly well. It hasn't quite led to the rally that we've hoped it would just yet, but it's still in the cards as, an ideal way to say, look, Brexit, extension or not, should resolve in a peaceful manner, which the generally accepted conclusion is then that sterling would rally against the dollar. So let's get right into it. Are you in the camp <laughs> that the U.S. dollar index in general falls and pound, uh, euro, you know, we get strength out of there and what we saw in the dollar over the last year and change or so? has come to uh, an end and we are in now entering a a weaker dollar environment we are so we have a speculative call out uh beginning uh late march that uh, the dollar is near the end of its run uh and we decided to open two trades one being long sterling versus the dollar and the other being long euro versus the dollar to uh present our speculative view that the dollar should be rolling over soon uh, we thought of the Q2 story, so we're a uh, third of the way through Q2, and we haven't really gone anywhere, uh, but it's a medium-term call, and I think the second half of this year will we'll show that this view plays out. 
I've been looking for this weaker dollar all year, to be perfectly honest, Paul. And um, I haven't been right. I haven't necessarily been wrong either. It really hasn't done anything all year. We're pretty much, what, flat on, on the year, depending on where we close today, right? I, I've been in the camp, and I know you're – you know, you're everything but equities. I, I, I've been in the camp that a weaker dollar is going to be good for stocks in general, particularly emerging markets, right? And, and sort of that rotation. And I think that if the dollar were to kind of just rip through these levels, uh, kind of like the highs from the fourth quarter, for example, like in the dollar index, that I think that that would most likely come in an environment where stocks are selling off. And uh, dollars almost kind of seen as a safe haven. So um, uh, are you allowed to, to kind of uh, opine on that? I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, sure. So here's the big picture thing about the dollars is simple this year is, and that's where maybe even where technicians may struggle a bit is understanding the interest rate differentials between one currency and another. Right, right now, the risk-free interest rate in the U.S. is set between two and a quarter and two and a half percent. When you go to Europe, it's basically zero, right? It's practically it's negative, right? So to be long euro dollar, right? You're long euro and short the dollar. That means I have to be paying the interest on the dollar, right? That's expensive. And that's the problem that the dollar is having is that the interest rate is so attractive to multi-billion dollar corporations, money managers, pension funds, you name it, that they could buy dollars and get interest or they can come and buy bonds and get a little extra interest right, versus global opportunities. So, so you see, that's why the dollar isn't rolling over just yet and why it's so range bound for so long. So it might not even be a discussion about what happens between the dollar and the stock market to say, you know, which one kind of wins. And if the dollar sells off stocks rally, because the dollar could sell off if the Fed cuts interest rates. If the Fed cuts interest rates, JC, what do you think is happening to the stock market? It's probably not looking too good, right? Right. So it's 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 there are there are so many idiosyncratic stories going on between uh, what's happening in in the dollar, what's happening in rates, what's happening in I don't know, Turkey. Uh, that's been a big mover lately. What's happening in Korea? What's happening in now now in stocks in between you know China U.S. trade war nonsense and everything else, right? Hold on, let's talk about yeah. that. Let's talk about the Korea for a second. So sure. we're talking about USD KRW, right? Dollar one. Why yeah. why is why is that relevant? Why should somebody listening at home give a damn what the dollar versus the Korean one is doing? Yeah. So uh when you look at the FX markets, um and assuming you're an equity junkie, right? Uh and you're 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 tracking what US equity markets are doing. Uh, I, you really should have a pulse on, I think, three FX crosses. One is dollar Korea for certain. The second is either dollar yen or Aussie yen, arguably both, uh, because Aussie yen is kind of like a turbocharged dollar yen. Uh, and the third might be something like dollar versus the South African rand. Uh, and the reason is they are the three generally accepted uh, risk on risk off barometers uh, for FX markets. So when dollar is outperforming the Korean won, that's actually a risk off sentiment. Uh, when Aussie is underperforming the yen or Aussie yen is going down, that means the yen is stronger than Aussie, that's a risk off sentiment. Same goes for dollar yen uh, and dollar rand would act like dollar Korea. Dollar rand going higher is probably a risk off sentiment. So dollar Korea. Uh, and its weekly chart actually has a massive head and shoulders bottom that just a couple weeks ago broke out yeah. above 1120, right? It had cleared its neckline in March, and its measurement targeted something like 1220, and it's about halfway there, right? Now, in this rally over the last couple of weeks, we know what's happened to the S&P 500. It's dragged it lower. So if you believe in the full measured move target of dollar Korea going up to the 1220s, and it's only halfway there, well, that could be a headwind to the S&P. And why why is the dollar Korea uh, Korea so such a risk on risk off currency? Um, so, well, you know, Korea is um, a popular EM location with reasonable liquidity in Asia. Um, so there is the potential to get size in the trades that you do. Um, the ties of Korea to China, as well as to you know, 
North Korea, like it or not, uh, express the sentiment through the cross. And, um, you know, it, it has a tie very well also to Taiwan, which is, you know, very much connected to technology and semiconductor businesses of the world. So I would say those are three probably pretty good reasons. The interest rate is not, we were discussing the carry trades before and the challenge of selling a dollar because you have to essentially pay the U.S. dollar interest rate. Uh, you know, the interest rate right now is not that much of an issue. The carry trade is not there at the moment, but those are the three reasons I think support it. And then why is Aussie yen uh, such a turbocharged uh, dollar yeah, yen? So Aussie is, so, so moving out of uh, the dollar EM space, right? Emerging markets, dollar versus emerging markets. When you go to Aussie yen, you essentially have the uh, commodity currency of G10 versus the most stable, safe currency in G10, right? So Aussie being, you know, when growth is good, uh, companies are buying uh, hard materials, right, to build things, copper, uh, granites, whatever it may be, right? And um, they're selling uh, currencies like the yen that really don't afford them much growth at all. They just afford them stability. So when Aussie yen is going lower, it usually means that Aussie is weakening, so markets are sliding from risk because Aussie is the risk on currency mm -hmm. and yen is the safe currency that doesn't really move. So they buy it and you get that turbocharge effect or almost like a leverage effect where Aussie yen moves a lot more than something like dollar yen would. And then why? So if the uh, dollar czar, right, the dollar uh, South African ran breaks out from this, let's just call it a head and shoulders bottom over the last seven, eight months, call it whatever you want. Um, looks yeah. like a bottoming sort of process to me, just kind of like just eyeing it, USDZAR. Yeah. Um, if that breaks out, that is most likely happening in an environment where equities globally are selling off? Yes. Global risk would likely be selling off. You would have, uh, you know, weakness in EM. Uh, look, it can be idiosyncratic, right? But it's you, know, you go through a process, I go through a process, we try to puzzle all the pieces together, right? Stick them all together and, and, and figure it out. Is this something a little bit on the side where dollar rand pops, you know, a figure? Or is this something that is linked to what's going on in the dollar turkey chart, the dollar Korea chart, the Aussie yen chart, right? The 10 year, you know, treasury chart, right? Um, and is this something that can really snowball? Uh, dollar rand breaking out would add to that. Uh, you know, uh, already confirmed pattern and breakouts in, in dollar Korea, dollar Turkey, double bottom. That looks like it's rounding up to go, you know, 660, maybe even to a new all time high. Um, these are stories that will weigh on global risk. Speaking of global risk, we've seen an interesting correlation uh, between crude oil and the S&P 500 um, and then recent uh, simultaneous rollovers in crude oil and the S&P 500. You think that correlation's here to stay? And um, you know, what do you think about oil? With that being said, sure. So, you know, our call for oil this year was to see WTI make it into the plus or minus sixty-five to sixty-nine dollar area, and that's where we wanted to start looking for a potential top in, in, in price action. You never know if you know when price action gets to your target if there will be a top or not, or if it can overshoot or you know, if it doesn't get there, it undershoots, right? But we know that from our target that that's about where we wanted to start looking. So we started looking in price action over the last couple of weeks. To us, didn't really form a, let's say, a solid top on the daily chart, but it certainly started to break down and trigger some trend-following bearish signals, whether it be new 20-day lows, uh, you know, breaking down below trend line support. Uh, you know, it's been holding that 60-61 figure for uh, about a week or so now, but it's trading heavy, and I think it's going to go lower before it, you know, can really uh, do anything else. Well, I mean, the last couple of years, crude oil and the S&P 500 pretty much look exactly the same. So if uh, if we're in a in a weaker oil environment, um, you know, I can't I can't imagine stocks looking too well during that period, right? Well, it all ties back to that global growth story, right? Um, you know, we talked about Aussie if if you look at the copper chart lately, same idea. Copper prices had an optimistic breakout in January, uh, literally sat for about eight weeks and did nothing, and then it reversed, and it's been selling off. So if you know oil prices are going down, copper prices are going down, and you're saying that that's correlated with the S&P going down, 
uh, and Ozidaler itself is actually sitting on the 70 figure for, I think, all year almost, right? Trying to bottom. If you, JC, if you, if you hit a level enough, what happens? Ultimately, it breaks through, right? There you go. And that's what Aussie Dollar's been doing to that 70 figure. It's just been pounding it, it's just pounding it all year. Yep. So, right, if the dollar's going to, you know, sell off, Aussie Dollar will survive. But the dollar rallies and, you know, the, the medium term view heading into the summer here is invalidated. Aussie's going to go a lot lower and that's going to drag commodities lower. And, yeah, that might that might bend the S&P. Why don't we talk about, uh, speaking of the Aussie dollar, what happened at the beginning of the year when uh, Aussie just like, it was like almost like a flash crash sort of situation, right? And then nasty reversal and then it ripped. What happened there? Yeah. So that was a, a liquidity event, I believe, driven by the Japanese yen. And that impacted pretty much all the charts. And now we have this very silly looking tail <laughs> to deal with, right? For, for a very long time. So silly. And, uh, right? And, and, you know, if you throw up a, a dollar yen weekly chart and look at 2016 tails, 2017 tails, 2018 tails, and now 2019, right? This, this is like the new normal. Right? The last three years, you have these, these major swings, whether they're event, event driven, it could be, you know, a, a presidential election of some kind it could be uh, the results from a vote like you know a brexit or something like that it, it could be uh you know somebody firing you know nuclear missiles over hawaii or, you know, or japan or whatever it is right these events they create these tensions in the market where the markets essentially crack and there are these big drawdowns now did anybody trade that 104 and change low in dollar yen you know during a flash crash no uh, nearly impossible to actually trade it, but that data point is there. And JC, I read your stuff. You always, t you know, you're always touting. Look, when prices happen, they can't be restated, right? You can't change them unless there's like an exchange error, right? Mm -hmm. There isn't really an exchange in FX markets, right? The machines print what happened, and that's it, right? You have the bid, you have the ask, and you have, you know, the mid. So somehow that value happened in the machines. And now that's what technicians and chartists have to contend and read. So do we say, well, look, market action discount on everything, whatever, prices moving trends and history repeats itself. And that data point is valid because that event happened. I think so. The low in dollar yen in early January was the exact same low from last year. So, I mean, like the, there was clearly support somewhere. <laughs> exactly. Yes. Right. So we've traded down to the to this level uh, twice, right? And then there's a nice trend line coming in from that 2016 low where we've traded below it throughout the course of a week due to some sort of event, but we've never actually closed below it. So it's, you know, Dolly is falling right now. Um, you know, it's below the, the daily cloud. That was a big thing this week. It, uh, it attempted to rally on, on the risk recovery, but it never filled the gap on the Sunday open, the gap down that it had. Uh, and it's just broken some support levels and it's a tactically bearish trend here where, you know, if it gets into the 108 and back to that trend line, right, that might be the place to start accumulating dollars versus the yen, which would be risk on. But I think at this point, what you, you know, risk or face with that trade is some sort of, you know, flash crash event again, because that's what's been happening more and more over the last few years. You know, Paul, one of the things that you told me recently is more like a, of the language of technical analysis, right? You mentioned, we, you know, we talk about the support and resistance and head and shoulders, this and that. Um, you speak with PMs. I mean, this you're, this isn't like a, a book you read or a class you take. Like, this is real life with humongous PMs. Can you talk to me a little bit about the language and the terminology that you use with them and maybe some advice on, you know, other technicians out there that are listening, sort of, um, sort of the mentality uh, that you need to have in the real world, in, in, in things that actually happen with real money. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, the conversations generally start around uh, the themes that are in the market. Right? It could be, you know, is the Fed gonna cut rates or are they going to talk, uh, turn hawkish and, you know, potentially hike rates again, right? Uh, it could be 
Uh, we mentioned Brexit a couple of times, but it could be Brexit, right? It could be uh, inflation, right? Is inflation actually going to kick up in the U.S. or not? I mean, JC, I'm a technical strategist, right? I have no reason why I should be trying to forecast the next inflation print or the next GDP print, right? No, no idea at all. But what I do know is that the, the tools we've acquired in the technical books and studies can help us address those themes. And in the thick world, the way you talk about some of those themes is actually opposite that a lot of the material we learned about. And that's because a lot of the material we learned from is focused on equity markets, equity indices, and stocks. Right? When you move into the bond market, fixed income especially, right, and you look at 10-year treasury yields, for example, 10-year treasury yields falling is bullish. And what I mean by that is price action is going up, which causes yields to go down. So that's how the, the, the market will talk about bonds, right? But if yields are falling in our charts, right, and, and they're heading towards the 200-week moving average at 2.35%, we're inclined as technicians to say 2.35% is support. It's not. In the bond market, they consider 2.35% resistance because they trade on the prices, right? Uh, credit markets or uh, spread markets, different kinds of interest rates. They use the terms, you know, do you want to pay this or receive this? Uh, you know, uh, are, are we overbought or oversold, right? Uh, coming back to the 10-year yield example, if 10-year yields fall really fast and sharply and the RSI goes below 30, the bond market is actually overbought, but yields are oversold, right? So if you say that 10-year treasuries are oversold by looking at the 10-year yield chart, you've inverted your terminology. They're actually overbought. I think that adds a lot of value. Yeah. I, you know, come back to like the VIX in, in equity land, right? Is, you know, the VIX trending up is not bullish, right? That's increased volatility that's potentially bearish, right? That is bearish. Um, you know, if you put an RSI on the VIX and the RSI, the VIX goes above 70, the VIX is overbought, but the market is oversold, right? So, you know, it's, it's, it's turning that corner there to talk about how those specific markets actually trade. Well, while we're on the subject, volatility is uh, basically at the highs for the year. Any thoughts on what this spike might mean uh, to risk moving forward? And is this little spike in volatility the spike? And now we get back down to, you know, 12, 13 on the VIX? Or is this volatility here to stay and increase potentially? Uh, I, I'll be honest, JC. I'm biased. I want to see this volatility stay. <laughs> it's, Why? it's good for our business. It's good for our clients. It's good for our, our trading desk. Uh, when markets just sit and go nowhere, which is basically what, you know, G10FX, for example, has done, uh, you know, this year, right? The dollar hasn't moved. The euro's barely moved, right? Uh, when volatility just falls flat on its face and nothing moves, no one's trading, right? No one has a, you know, a high conviction. No one is necessarily compelled to try and put on, you know, uh, some big trend following like trades. Um, and so we need the vol to stay. We need it to stay. All right. I got a question for you, Mr. Paul. <laughs> so I look at the U.S. 10-year yield, right? Um, you know, the low in 2012 and then the low in 2016. U.S. 10-year yields, right? We broke below it slightly and then it ripped from there, as we are well aware. Then I look at a chart of silver and... You know, I, I, it just seems awfully familiar um, and kind of reminds me of that major double bottom in U.S. 10s. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Oh, you're doing a monthly versus a weekly. Are you doing a weekly of silver or a monthly of silver? Yeah. You know, I'm looking at the low in 2012 in the U.S. 10-year yield and the low in 2016, kind of like that double bottom, right? That, that big monster double bottom and, and then the huge move in yields. And then I look at the silver low at the end of 2015, early 2016, and then the recent low that we've seen uh, in silver in the fourth quarter. And I'm just kind of comparing that multi-year sort of double bottom, um, you know, support at those levels. It just reminds me of what U.S. 10-year yields looked like a few years ago. 
Yeah, I see what you're looking at. Um, it's it's almost like ten year yields for a while were was leading silver prices. And now that silver has made that 2018 19 low uh, and that second double bottom, um, that maybe there's hope for silver prices to rally and essentially bonds to sell off, which would mean higher yields. Uh, but fitting that into a macro framework, that's a tough one. Um, yeah, but Paul, but Paul, in a weaker dollar environment, right, which you and I, I guess, are, are on the same page, right? So if you guys out there want to fade me and Paulie by dollars, <laughs> um, yeah. you know, if it's, a, if it's a weaker dollar, listen, my bearish dollar thesis is very clear. If we break out and we're above 98 on the, uh, on, on the Dixie, you know, there, it's impossible for me to be bearish dollars, right? But just if yeah. we're below that, I, I, I guess I could, I could stick with that call. Um, exactly. If the dollar falls, metals are doing well, no? That's the right school of thought. Yes, I would agree with you. Metals should be doing better if the dollar falls, yes. All right, but why why do you have to hesitate and give me like seven seconds before you answer, yeah, you're like, you're, it's almost like you're hedging, like, why are you so skittish? If the dollar falls, metals do well, no? All right, so we're short five-year break-evens right now. And to be short five-year break-evens essentially means you're bearish inflation, or meaning that uh, the inflation targets that the Fed has set won't be reached, and they either have to do something to make it happen, or inflation could even go down. If inflation is going to decrease, commodity prices are not going to do well. What we see in the break-even charts, right, confirm what we're seeing more so in the oil charts. So to be bearish break-evens, bearish oil it's a little tough to just say be bullish metals. Now, gold, silver, precious metals, palladium, platinum, I don't know if you looked at those, those look, and then they've actually had a, a decent run so far. Those look like they could have a lot more room to run. But if you're saying silver, gold, platinum, palladium, and the precious group rally, the dollar sells off, and we're on the same page about oil and copper selling off, that could mean that the Fed is cutting rates, so the dollar falls, and what's left is for those precious metals to rise. I mean, it makes sense to me. What about something mm -hmm. like um, what about something like a tips versus uh, like a tip TIP versus TLT sort of ratio, sort of like a inflation protected treasuries versus traditional treasuries, and that ratio really looks like crap. Um, you know, doesn't seem to me like much in inflation being priced in. How do you feel about that ratio? Is that something you look at? Uh, not that specific one. We do look at tips, break evens, and 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 the related. Uh, but JC, I think that's a very interesting chart for you to publish. What about <laughs> you mentioned? <laughs> you mentioned palladium and platinum. What about the ratio between palladium and platinum? Have you taken a look at the long term chart of that? And it kind of just getting back to where we were 20 years ago almost, sort of like a historic double top. How do you feel about that? Palladium platinum ratio. And is that something that we should care about at all? Or is that or is this just like a random arbitrary ratio? I think that's pretty random and arbitrary. But okay. there is a ticker on Bloomberg for it. And I'm dying to see what it looks like because you know, if you don't look, you never know. Wow. So you see the high in 2000, 2001, whenever that high was? Yeah. And then that yeah, high that we just saw? Yeah. It's crazy, right? That is. So what does that mean? What happened in 2000, 2001, JC? Oh, oh man. I just, that was a leading question. Know. I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't know what it means. And, 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 you know, for me, what I, I probably, you know, one of, you know, we all have our flaws and I think it's important to be self-aware, you know, and, you know, one of the, the things that I've had to try to overcome uh, over the years is really overthinking the intermarket complex. Cause for you guys who don't know out there, Paul and I have known each other for a long time. We actually studied for the CMT together. This was like, Oh, six, Oh seven. Um, back in the old days, they used to have this thing called CMTI. I think it was called the CMT Institute. And basically, there were classes that, you know, CMTs, current 
CMT charter holders, um, you know, were the professors, if, if you will. And Paul and I were the same class, I think level one and two, or maybe one, two, and three. I think it was all three, JC. Yeah, good memory. Yeah, and the way we were trained, like our sort of generation, I feel like, was very uh, influenced by John Murphy. And, uh, you know, I talked to Ari Wald about it and, and Krinsky also, uh, you know, kind of all of us are sort of contemporaries. We, we took the exam at around a similar time. So I feel like we're very intermarket oriented in the way we approach things. And one of the things I, I've struggled with in the past, I've gotten better at, is being like, well, you know, if this is going, if the dollar's going to do this, and then metals are going to do that, then rates are going to do that. And it's like, you, you, ultimately, you get to like the fifth derivative, right? It's like, yeah. well, if you think rates are going up, just sell bonds, right? <laughs> There's no reason, yeah. you know? So I look at something like a palladium platinum, and I try to think about what some, like what a collapse in this ratio could mean. Um, and I really have no, I, 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 I don't know. It doesn't really mean anything to me, I feel like, right? Um, did when this ratio peaked, precious metals started doing well, you know, so, right? And then when this ratio bottomed, essentially bottomed before precious metals peaked, um, so almost kind of like a, a, a risk on for precious metals. Do you buy that or no? Um, I think it's a tough sell on a standalone product, right? And I think this comes back to process. If you're looking for charts to support or refute a view that the S&P 500 is peaking or dropping, right? In this case, potentially peaking, right? This ratio at its 2000, 2001 peak level could coincide with some sort of medium term or worse peak in the S&P, right? But what do the breadth of your charts about the S&P and other intermarket charts say about that? Um, I could say that if you look at a ratio of the U.S. long bond treasury future divided by either the S&P or the Russell 2000, those ratios have fallen to levels that were synonymous with economic downturns. So the ratio of U.S. long bond treasury futures divided by the S&P uh, had declined by the end of 2018 to its 2007 low. Uh, and versus the Russell, that came down as essentially sitting on 23-year-old trend line support area. Uh, also uh, fairly synonymous with the 2007 low too, but going back to uh, about 1993. So it's, are you looking to answer a question, you know, is the longest, you know, economic expansion or bull market and equities at an end? Well, you know, there's always a few charts that you can find that say yes and a few others that say no. It's just a question of your process and which ones you weigh more heavily. I have a question for you, Paul. So we talk about this long uh, bull market, you know, 10-year uh, bull market or nine-year, however long it's been. And, you know, I, I, I look at I, I look at stocks as an asset class. And within that period, we, I mean, we could just use the S&P. We've had three 20% declines in S&Ps during that period. And just from 2011 down to the lows in 2016, I mean, just what is it? Five years of emerging markets falling, you know, literally going straight down during that period. It doesn't seem like a bull market to me. I, I look at, you know, European equities putting in lower highs over the last 20 years right since the peak in 2000 doesn't seem like a bull market to me london FTSE 100 flat for 20 years doesn't seem like a bull market to me canada one of the most important markets in the world flat since you know since the 07 highs right um 08 07 08 highs right, um, right, right. australia asx still below the, the, the their 07 08 highs japan we don't even need to go there i mean i don't know it doesn't <laughs> does, they don't seem like bull markets to me what do you think so I think the term that I've heard the most in the last three and a half years since I've started my role at Bank of America is, so basically what you're saying is, and this is in quotes, more U.S. equity market outperformance, right? Um, and that's the generally accepted uh, takeaway from a lot of conversations is people 
migrating back to just being, okay, the U.S. continues to outperform. Okay, the U.S. continues to outperform. So it'll be a big call, JC, at some point. Uh, don't know when. Don't know, you know if it's today. Don't know if it's 10 years from now. But when the S&P actually begins to underperform global markets on a substantial scale. And when that happens... I feel like that's an environment that stocks in general are doing well. U.S. might be underperforming, but things with a lot of international exposure and, um, you know, not to mention just, you know, U.S. investors could just buy ETFs. I feel like that's an environment where we want to be buying stocks, no? Yeah, I, I would agree with you. Uh, and I would say that if that's what's happening, that's when our dollar call will be right because the market will be selling dollars or selling U.S. assets to chase higher performing assets globally. But if that dollar index breaks out above that 98 that it's been struggling with, I mean, you said it yourself, yeah. the more times the level is tested, right? So that dollar breaks out, you know, that whole, um, you know, that whole thesis got to throw that away, right? Yeah, look, like the dollar looks vulnerable in G10, right? In a lot of our charts, but the dollar looks fantastic versus EM, right? So it has to come back to, I think, uh, what's going to happen to broad commodities, right? inflation, and what is the Fed going to do next? And if the Fed's going to cut rates, well, that could be something that takes at least a little bit of steam out of the dollar, uh, preventing the Dixie from going much further. But I'm with you, JC. If the dollar index has another breakout like it did a couple of weeks ago through that 98 area, I mean, you know, we could be looking at 103, 105, uh, potentially even 108. I can't imagine stocks doing too well in that environment, huh? Big cap, for sure. But I would think your, your, your short-term relative charts of, you know, the Russell versus the S&P will probably turn up. It's interesting. Um, Paul, I, I, you know, you and I, we could literally do this all, all, all day, you know, but at some point we need to call it an end. But before, before I let you run, you know, you're, you're incredibly fortunate. You literally, I mean, your entire career, uh, you have been, uh, able to speak with the biggest PMs in the world, all over the world. You know, you were at Bloomberg for how, uh, how long? 10 years? Yeah. Uh, just a little over 10 years at Bloomberg and, uh, moved over to Bank of America, uh, for about three and a half now. So a lot of young technicians and, you know, even seasoned market uh, veterans that are, you know, trying to step up their technical analysis game um, out there listening, you know, you, literally you talk to the biggest and the best, I mean, your whole career. So what, what have you learned and what sort of advice would you give to somebody out there listening that, you know, maybe they're not going to pick up in a book uh, or in a class somewhere? Um, let's see. It's a good question. Uh, we could probably go on for a couple hours. So. <laughs> on that one too. You know, the markets are very, very focused on levels. But I've found in the last few years, especially that levels are traded around. And once they're traded around, the markets decide if they're going to break them or not. So the lesson there is a little bit of patience, both in your view and in seeing the market confirm or refute your view. I'm a believer in one of the books I read a while ago that uh, one of the quotes was, if, if the markets don't go the direction you think they're going sooner than, you know, let's say later, right? Then you're probably wrong and you should take the trade off. Uh, I get that. But when you challenge a level, patience for that level to actually break if you you know can withstand the risk is is really important i would say the second thing uh, presentation skills i think are huge in technicals right? we have some of the best charts out there to talk about all of the great themes in the world right but if you have too much stuff on your chart jc i do this i i because I could put, you know, 10 indicators on a chart and digest it real quick. It's, 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 it's what we do, right? You, you can. But when you, <laughs> yeah, when you, when you formulate your view, take 90% of the stuff off 
right? And present the chart as is. Put in the footnotes if you want to. Here are signals that are bullish, whatever, right? Uh, but that presentation skill takes a while to acquire because you have to marry your process with your presentation, right? And that's, that's, that's a big challenge uh, and something to conquer uh, during a career. Um, I would say the third thing, you know, there's, there are more people interested in what the charts and technicals are saying than even I'd imagined would be true. And I've, I've found that based on right the last 13 years, 14 years of going out and, and, and talking with clients about charts and technicals, right? But to motivate an organization, uh, a team, uh, to try and uncover these uh, candidates to work with can be a challenge, both based on you know how much is on everyone's plate, but also the priority that you know markets or clients or colleagues generally give to technical, right? So if you nail your presentation, right, and then you nail a couple of good calls you'll start to snowball in your career and, and, and in your progress. So uh, I, I think those three things, you know, speak, speak a lot to, to what it takes. I think that's great advice. I love it, Paul. One more thing, when you talk about, you know, how you're surprised that there, there are more monster PMs using technical analysis and looking at charts, are you finding that, um, that trend higher in America? or globally, maybe in Asia or Europe, or is it literally across the board? I think my bias to that question is probably to say a little more internationally. Um, the technicals, I think, do very well in Europe. They do very well in Asia. Uh, you know, North America, you know, definitely, you know, they like technicals. Um, but North America, right, it's almost like the U.S. has less potential reasons to use technicals because every state has the same currency, right? When you go to Europe, right, there's so many different currencies, you know, it, it, they need another sort of framework to work around the different kinds of businesses that are there. So, you know, internationally, I would say a little more, uh, but still, you know, technicals are, are received well in the Americas, too. I love it, Paul. I've been trying to get you on uh, the podcast for a long time. You know, in my opinion, you're hands down one of the best in the business. So, you know, it means a lot that you uh, came on the podcast. Thanks. JC, the pleasure was mine. Thank you for having me. Thank you for listening to the All Star Charts podcast with JC Peretz on Technical Analysis Radio. To see all of the charts mentioned on today's show, please visit allstarcharts.com slash podcast.